Good evening and welcome to Business 7. On the menu tonight, interest rates, bank fees and non-performing loans. Also some great news about Kelp Blue in Namibia. But first, let's visit the marketplace. The Bank of Namibia says non-performing loans in the country has breached its intervention trigger point of 6%. It currently stands at 6.1%. Now, Recently, at the monetary policy debate, the whole issue of non-performing loans were also discussed. We're taking a look at the debate. You mentioned that the NPL is currently above the supervisory threshold which uh, requires a trigger or is a, a trigger for supervisory intervention. I wanted to understand which segment of the market is predominantly contributing to the NPL and if I have the opportunity to, to assume if it's for example in the housing market or the housing segment rather, what would be the implication for the housing market, if that be the case. In response to the question from uh, Mr. Isep, <clears throat> just in terms of the supervisory thresholds as well as the intervention measures, you, you know that we are coming from an era of, uh, of COVID and uh, the relief measures that we've introduced, uh, particularly uh, the repayment moratoriums. That paid off significantly, and I think that uh, limited the, the impact that we would have seen because uh, mortgages are making up say 50 percent of your balance sheets of the banking industry but what we've seen of late was more an aspect of um, consumption based credit in terms of the uptick that we've seen there overdrafts personal loans and, and, and other loans and advances in particular and and, and, and that's i think testimony to probably where we find ourselves in terms of uh, the, 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 the inflationary pressures that we are seeing. I'll start with the impact of inflation on the housing market. As we all know, we are still in a very low growth uh, environment as an economy, and interest rates still remain on the high side. So the impact on the housing market, of course, in such an, env an environment will be indeed very high. But as a Bank of Namibia, we've also taken a very responsible approach. We, by a policy and legislative intervention, during 2022-2023, closely worked with relevant ministries to make sure that as far as repossession of house houses are concerned, that Namibia's housing uh, repossession is aligned to uh, global based. So in the past, if you uh, were indebted to a bank and your property served as collateral, it would have been easy for you to lose your property via an auction and the equity that you invested in that property were no longer protected. With financial stability, at the back of our minds and critically important to the conversation, we assisted with crafting a new law and currently two laws um, have passed parliament. I understand they will be operationalized very soon. The Magistrates Court Act, the High Court Act. And what it now enables is to put court in the forefront of deciding for what a house will be sold on open market. Underscoring that is truly the fair market value of the property. 
making sure that the borrower does not lose out on equity, but also simultaneously that our banking sector is protected in terms of uh, the capital they extended for the property to be acquired. A discussion about banks' performance, especially at the Bank of Namibia, will not be a discussion without the issue of banking fees raised. At the recent discussion on the monetary policy, Bank of Namibia Governor Johannes Gavachap had this to say about banking fees. In terms of the performance of the banks, the whole issue on fees and charges is a moot point for Namibians. And I said the other day, last week, when I addressed the parliament, that what has happened, if you look at those pictures, the past two, three years, we have been used to an inflation of around three, four, five percent. And now all of a sudden you have got inflation that has spiked. And you know, we are getting to an average last year of five, six, or just below six at 5.9. And you've got interest rate that shot up. So our people have become intolerant of these high, high interest rates. And they, they actually tell us we, we don't like this. So as the Bank of Namibia, the government has changed the law, empowering the Minister of Finance now to regulate fees and charges. The Bank of Namibia have done a study. We have consulted the industry. And we made recommendations to the minister and it's for the minister to decide what he wants to do with the fees and charges in the country. But your point is right. Our people are struggling. The South African Reserve Bank wants to lower its inflation target to a midpoint of about 3.5% and the latest indications are that they want to do so by 2025, by the end of 2025. This of course will have repercussions in Namibia because the Namibia dollar is pegged to the South African rand and therefore follows the interest rate developments um, in our neighbouring country very closely. Chief Economist of Capricorn Asset Management, Flores Berg, uh, raised this issue recently at the Bank of Namibia's monetary policy discussion. What is the MPC's view of the mooted new inflation target regime that the Saab is talking about putting on the table? It was as if it was still a long ways away, but now it's suddenly moving closer to reality, apparently, if one looks at the uh, lessons to, the, to the, the central bank governor there. In my view, the 3.5% midpoint is too demanding for the South African and Namibian economies. The 4.5% is reasonable, but the long-term structural features of our economy, I think, probably does not lend it to such a, a low target, uh, because in all practical purposes, that will just mean higher interest rates for longer. You basically have to kill the economy. Ask a question about the mooted inflation target. Currently, the South African Reserve Bank is targeting 4.5%, and there's a possibility that they are talking about Treasury and the central bank around 3.5%. The rationale for that is, if you look at where the target is of South African peers, you know, the European Central Bank is targeting 2%, the Fed is targeting 2%, although I hear the other day, you know, the 2% that the Fed is targeting is, is probably too low, and there's a whole debate about that. If you look at the peers like the Central Bank of Brazil and South Africa, I get the sense that on that basis, from the target of 4.5 is too high. But you are right, if they need to go to a lower target, and at this stage it's just a discussion paper that they have got, interest rates will probably remain at a higher level until they get to 3.5. Because at this point in time, they forecast and project a 4.5 midpoint by second quarter next year. So, but if they change and said it's gonna be 
It's not going to be second quarter next year. It's going to be much longer. But currently, the midpoint is 4.5. But if it is going to be 3.5, which is speculated around that, the rates will be much higher. And do you think structurally the economy can afford that? There's a long debate about that. You've got a view, SAP has got a different view that I've listened to the other day. Welcome to Namibia, where adventure meets tranquility. With Enjoy, you have access to a wide range of accommodations to suit every traveler's taste and budget. Experience the finest dining and hospitality Namibia has to offer. Booking your dream accommodation is just a few clicks away with Enjoy. Join thousands of happy travelers who have trusted Enjoy for their Namibian getaway your gateway to unforgettable Namibian adventures. Visit us today at enjoy.my.na. The International Monetary Fund this week released its latest economic growth projections for the world. Let's take a look at what they expect. Kelp Blue, that's a company operational in Ludwitz, harvesting giant kelp, has been granted a commercial license for 15 years. Of course, the company also intends to list its uh, first blue bond on the NSX later this year. Now, if you don't know what um, Kelp Blue is all about, this video will t tell you exactly what it's doing in terms of of a kelp harvesting. This video with the courtesy of Kelp Blue. Meet kelp, giant kelp. At Kelp Blue, we are cultivating this extraordinary seaweed to play an outsized role in capturing carbon and helping to combat climate change while providing a huge boost to the marine ecosystem. Our cultivated kelp forests capture CO2 from the atmosphere and the ocean, storing it in the deep ocean layers. Let us show you how. We start at the very beginning. This is a piece of Soros tissue, the fertile material that is found on mature kelp blades, these flat, leaf-like structures. This tissue is taken to our hatchery, a safe and controlled environment where we nurture the kelp from near microscopic gametophytes through to sporophytes, the multicellular leaf-like stage. Once big enough, the sporophytes are attached to a special twine and made ready to be planted in the ocean. At the outplanting stage, the twine is wrapped around our farm structures. In the wild, kelp uses hard substrates such as rocks on which to grow. Our farm uses lines and ropes onto which the holdfast, the root-like foot of the kelp, can securely attach. The farms are submerged in the ocean. 
In the shallower waters, the kelp grows directly from the ocean floor. In the deeper water, we have installed structures that are anchored at around 15 meters below the surface. The perfect depth to maximize access to nutrients and light, while keeping the young kelp out of the most violent movement of the waves. Each structure, approximately the size of three tennis courts, is designed to move in harmony with the forces of the ocean. In a few months, the kelp will start appearing at the surface where it forms a floating canopy. Giant kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet, growing up to 50 centimeters per day. With this fast growth, the kelp quickly absorbs carbon from the surrounding waters and stores it in its tissues. Some of the kelp naturally dies off and drifts away to be cycled into deeper ocean layers. Kelp also exudes dissolved organic matter, very small particles, including carbon. Our modeling shows that currents sweep the carbon from the kelp away from the coast and into the deep ocean. Once it reaches the deeper ocean layers, it remains undisturbed for a very long time, long enough to have a significant effect on tackling climate change. But the environmental benefit of kelp forests is not just about carbon capture. These ecosystems also host many species that make the kelp forests their home. Kelp is considered a foundation species, meaning it has a role in structuring a marine community. Every month since our farms have been growing, we've seen new species visiting and making homes on our structures. Our dedicated marine monitoring team regularly check on the kelp and keep track of the biodiversity observed. They use a range of different methods, including active and passive acoustics, visual observations, lab analyses of water samples, and environmental DNA. We also constantly measure the water quality and send samples to a lab to measure the content of the dissolved organic carbon exuded by the kelp. Once the kelp grows to maturity and starts forming a canopy, some of the biomass is harvested to turn into sustainable alternatives for industries such as agriculture and packaging. Currently, the kelp is harvested by hand, but we have commissioned a fully automated, solar-powered, emission-free harvester, which will allow us to significantly scale up our operations. Our 3,500 ton capacity processing factory converts kelp biomass into essential products that also have a positive effect on the environment. Our first product is a biostimulant, a liquid kelp extract that helps boost the immune system of crops and plants making them more resilient to environmental stresses such as drought and heat, as well as helping them produce bigger yields. By 2030, our goal is to have over 6,500 hectares of seaweed installed across Namibia, New Zealand, Alaska and Chile, and to sell over 35 million litres of biostimulant, aiding over 200,000 farmers to transition towards regenerative agriculture. Our offshore technology allows for large-scale deployment and our solution is easily replicated in other locations around the world. At Kelp Blue, we often ask ourselves, how do we want the world to look in 200 years? Then we try to ensure that everything we do contributes to building that vision. Together we can build that better world. We just need to take the first step. E-Ticket, your online ticket solution for events and event marketing, bringing you ease of mind and making sure that your event gets out there. For more information, contact events at nmh.com.na. That's it from the Business 7 studio for uh, this week. We're playing out with a Reuters video um, covering the ongoing situation in uh, Kenya. This one in particular focuses 
on the lavish lifestyle of lawmakers, which has prompted the anger of the youth. Until next week, goodbye. Videos like this have added fuel to simmering anti-government anger in Kenya. The lavish lifestyles of lawmakers splashed across social media. Then you need to check yourself. In April and May, during the build-up to recent widespread protests, MP Zahir Janda posted these on TikTok, triggering an angry response online. Protesters have since tried to storm his home in the western town of Kisi. Janda did not respond to requests for comment. But he's also not the only one. Kenya's protests, initially sparked by proposed tax hikes, have increasingly drawn attention to the large salaries, perks and ostentatious lifestyles of lawmakers. That's in a country where three quarters of the population is young and well-paid work is scarce. And according to artist and activist Rachel Stephanie Akinyi, where most Kenyans are sleeping hungry. Why would you show us your lavish lifestyle and still not do your job as a leader, you know? What are you trying to show us? That we, 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 we have the power to use your money the way we want to, to take care of our own needs. But what about us? Fury boiled over in Kenya on June 25th, when protesters stormed parliament and set it ablaze. Since then, private residences and businesses of several lawmakers, mainly those associated with the ruling coalition, have been attacked. Ruto climbed down on the tax proposals and on Thursday, in a further sign of the pressure being brought by the protests, dismissed his entire cabinet apart from the foreign minister. Ruto, who came to power after portraying himself as a champion of low-income hustlers, has said some officials have displayed obnoxious opulence. And it's also an issue that was raised in Parliament by Senator Bonnie Kalwale. The public display of wealth and opulence unless members of the public can quickly see where you've gotten it, they will not be happy. Over the weekend, I was speaking of a young member of parliament from my community who has bought a helicopter. Yes, I have a, I have a helicopter. Lawmaker Didmus Barasa said protesters had valid concerns about what he called insensitivities over the government's handling of economic development. But he said his own personal wealth was a reward for legitimate business activities. The ancestral land, several houses, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, several uh, pieces of land both in Nairobi and out of Nairobi allows me to access credit of more than 500 million. Yeah? I am an inspiration of very many young people in this country. Barasa also denied that lawmakers were overpaid. They earn, however, around 33 times the national average wage. Kenyan lawmakers are also no strangers to allegations of corruption and waste. In 2023, Kenya ranked 126 out of 180 countries in the world by Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, down three places from 2022. Ruto has ordered a review of pay rises lawmakers and officials were due to receive in July. His office did not respond to requests for comment for this report. But having faced little opposition since his 2022 election win, he's now up against a youthful, plugged-in movement that does not appear to be fading. The backlash against lawmakers' opulence has seen their videos edited and reposted with negative comments. Social media platforms are awash with allegations of mismanaged funds. Activists have even built an AI-powered chatbot that spits out media reports of corruption allegations when a politician's name is entered. And they've also been sharing advice on how to recall lawmakers. In Kabete constituency near Nairobi, voters have collected 5,000 of the 10,000 signatures they need to recall their lawmaker. I'm hoping that Kabete will be able to inspire the rest of the country uh, to take action. Human rights activist Ndungi Gituku said they are taking their country back. If we don't put these people on check, he said, then that is it. It's the end of Kenya.